Hello, everybody, and welcome to another great day of chemistry. So today we're going to be taking all that knowledge we've gained about quantum mechanics, specifically about Z effective and electron shielding, penetration, Hun's rules, and even a little bit of Pauli principle, and use it to explain a lot of the famous periodic trends of the periodic table. So if you want to tag along, I highly encourage you grab a periodic table and see if you can follow. So one of the things we're going to go ahead and start off with is making specifically a lot of use of Hans rules about, about how electrons feel, uh, fill up as we go uh, to increasingly high uh, um, a number of electrons present, as, all, as well as uh, paying close attention to how each of these electrons feels the, uh, feels the pull of the nuclei because this is really gonna help dictri uh, dictate the energy of each of these various electrons, especially in the various orbitals. We're gonna use this to examine a lot of our periodic trends. So one of the ones we're gonna start with is by looking at atomic radii. A good way of thinking about atomic radii is let's say I've got a diatomic molecule like disodium, two sodium atoms right next to each other. So what we can then do is say that the atomic radii is literally just gonna be half the length of this diatomic bond because half of it belongs to this sodium atom, half of it belongs to that sodium atom. However, in truth, you may not be able to determine all of your radii <coughs> right, based on these diatomic molecules, but if you find a molecule where I have one atom bound to another that I do know the atomic radii for, we can use this to create the, a full list of atomic radii for almost all of our systems. And we're gonna find that this atomic radii is really controlled by two key features. Uh, the first of all is the nuclear charge. Because again, higher nuclear charge, the closer in the electrons are going to be to the nuclei and, the and they aren't gonna to wanna to venture very far away. However, we also find that, well, as uh, the principal quantum number goes up n, of course, I'm forced into a new shell of electrons. And that next shell is, by its very nature, going to be further out and away from the nuclei. So as my nuclear charge goes up, electrons contract until I jump up to a new shell. And then I see a big jump in my radii. And we can see this as we go through the periodic table. Lithium actually has a fairly large uh, radii of about 157 picometers. And then as I go to beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, it keeps decreasing. However, not too surprisingly, we see the biggest effect right away because that's when my Z effective goes up essentially by a large proportion. And then at the very end, while the Z effective is still going up a fair amount, it's less of a proportion of the total Z effective. And one of the very cool things is we see this as we go across any row of the periodic table, all the way from the second row, technically first, if you want to count hydrogen and helium, all the way down to the seventh, if you want to play around with francium. But no matter what, atomic radii is really uh, controlled by these two key trends. And it's worth noting that this idea of radii will often pull, play into a lot of our other periodic trends because again, the further away an electron is away from the atom, the less tightly bound it is going to be to our system. And that's something to keep in mind. So our next big periodic trend that everyone often cares about is ionization energy. So this is literally how much energy does it take to remove a valence electron? So not too surprisingly, all I need to do is figure out the uh, orbital, uh, the negative of the orbital energy for a given electron. So it's gonna be based on, of course, Rydberg's constant, the square of the Z effective and N squared. And so we get some very fun trends as we go across the periodic table. So as I go from hydrogen to helium, the Z effective goes way up. So of course, the ionization energy goes way up. <clears throat> However, when I go down to lithium, I now have literally doubled my N so I drop off of a giant cliff. And this is the big trend we first see. Ionization energies will typically go up because just like uh, radii, 
we see our Z effective grow as I go across the periodic table. And so my ionization energy is going to go up as each of those electrons sees more of the nuclei and says, hey, I like that nuclei. I don't want to go anywhere. But then we reach, <coughs> we reach the next noble gas, and N has to thus then increase. And we drop off of a cliff. And we see this big decrease in ionization energy. However, it turns out there's some very interesting, uh, interesting behaviors along the way. One of the cool things is what happens when I encounter, say, uh, I, in, I uh, go to a different subshell. So I go to lithium. Beryllium has a higher Z effective than lithium. But then I go to boron. And boron, I just in, uh, drop to a different subshell. And it turns out that the p orbital has way less of a Z effective than the s orbital. So I see this decrease. So we're going to see that with uh, boron, aluminum, scandium, and gallium. So anytime we change it, uh, uh, we jump to a new subshell, we see almost the minor version of this drop every time we go to a higher shell. However, that isn't the only thing that introduces a little bit of this wobble into our trend. The other big one we have to watch out for is every time I introduce spin pairing. So let's say I have, uh, I see that drop in boron. Carbon has a higher Z effective than boron. Nitrogen has a higher Z effective than carbon. However, when I go to oxygen, turns out oxygen has a slightly lower uh, ionization energy than nitrogen. And the reason why is because, well, I had to pair up an electron for the first time which means that electron doesn't really want to be there as much as we'd expect. And so this is one of those big things to watch out for. First time you introduce spin pairing energy, you're going to see this drop. So this is most notable when we're looking at nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and say selenium. However, it is worth noting that things get a lot messier when I start playing around with my d orbitals because we're constantly having to deal with the messiness of spin pairing and d orbitals, which we're going to pretty much leave for PCAM, or for inorganic chemistry. However, this is one of those big conflicting trends we have to watch out for. Uh, this paradox in between Z effective and N, and the fact that Z effective doesn't always have a nice linear increase, especially when we're acknowledging changing subshells, and, uh, and the nuance that is spin pairing, because it turns out Hun's rules real messy. This brings us to our last of our major periodic trends, and that's electron affinity. Now, one of the things I want to make note is that your book defines electron affinity a little bit differently than a lot of other sources. So pay very close attention to what definition of electron affinity is being used, Different disciplines and even subdisciplines will use different definitions of electron affinity. Your book defines electron affinity as essentially the amount of energy released per mole of essentially ion formed when I essentially remove an electron or when I gain an electron. So if I gain an electron, this should be a favorable process. So I should release energy. And that's essentially the form your book uses. A lot of other resources give it as if I except electron, my electron affinity is the change in energy. So thus, you see a sign flip of all of these numbers. However, with that forewarning, we're going to go ahead and talk about these periodic trends in terms of your book's notation. So one of the big things to watch out for electron affinity is it's kind of like ionization energy, but offset. So ionization energy cares about the stability of the, uh, of the valence electron. Electron affinity really focuses in on the stability of the next uh, empty orbital. So if I'm talking about hydrogen, this is going to be essentially the energy I, uh, this is all going to be about the energy released if I essentially add in an electron and form a helium atom. This completes an octet, loves, <coughs> fills a subshell, maximizes the effective, it's very favorable. We see something very similar with lithium. 
I go from having one electron in the s orbital to two electrons in the s orbital. This is again fairly favorable. Not immensely, but fairly. However, let's say I look at helium. Helium has a full has a full shell, which means if I go up a level and I look at that empty 2s orbital, well, the z effective on that 2s orbital is abysmal because most of it's being shielded by the helium. It's less than one. Not to mention, we also have to deal with the fact that n just increased, which means that my energy for that orbital is also abysmal. So we tend to see, as I go to the uh, Nobel gases, all of my Nobel gases tend to have very low electron affinities because I'm going to have a very bad uh, Z effective. And uh, for the um, next S orbital, as well as I have to deal with that pain of increasing the principal quantum number. We see also a similar behavior when I'm talking about my alkali earth metals. In these cases, it's less than I'm jumping a full subshell, uh, a shell, but still filling that next subshell is a little bit hard. Uh, as it turns out that I'm going to have a much lower Z effective for that P orbital, and I'm not exactly have a high Z effective to begin with. Uh, to begin with, so again, we tend to see very negative numbers for the alkali earth metals. However, then as I start walking across the periodic table, I start building up nuclear charge, and so my numbers tend to increase. So generally, we tend to see electron affinities increase as I go across the periodic table. But again, we have to watch out for a couple of these traps. And they're the same traps we saw for ionization energy. With the alkali earth metals, <coughs> we're essentially paying a penalty for increasing subshell. But we also see this fun little nuance with the pictogens. So this is the family of nitrogen, phosphorus, and arsenic. Because here, it's not that I'm increasing subshell. It's that I'm having to pay a penalty for spin pairing. And since nobody wants, uh, so since none of our electrons want a roommate, you have to put a little bit of extra in it for them in order to make it work. And nitrogen, which already baseline has a pretty low Z effective, just can't make it work. This explains the reason why nitrogen never seems to want to have a negative charge. It never wants an additional electron because its electron affinity is just so very terrible. Uh, however, by the time we get to phosphorus and arsenic, they don't exactly like having roommates, but they're big enough that they can make it work. They can find some extra room. So these are two of the biggest things to watch out as we're going across. However, things get a little bit more messy when I'm going down the periodic table. Because what I have to watch out for is that pesky problem of the ratio of Z effective to N. So as I go down the periodic table, my Z effective gets much bigger. Because, well, I've got more nuclei and my core electrons don't uh, screen out everything perfectly. So We'd expect all of our electron affinities to go up as I go down the periodic table, except for a pesky issue. My energy also is the Z effective squared over the principal quantum number squared. So as I go down the periodic table, I'm increasing my principal quantum number, and this is going to reduce the energy of the next electron. So that says that as I go down the periodic table, I'd expect my electron affinities to go down. And this is where we run into that problem of battling effects. And this is one of the things that makes the electron affinity one of the most notoriously messy trends. In effect, what tends to happen, especially when we're looking at the P block, is that we tend to maximize this balance of Z effective and N in the third row. Because as I go to the third row, I see a big jump in Z effective, but only a mild change in my N as I go from two to three. And especially when we're talking about squares, that's the difference in between four and nine. If I go, say, from my third row to my fourth row, that's the difference in between nine and 16. And I don't want to do that. So uh, in the end, it turns out that our, uh, our atom with the highest electron affinity of all atoms turns out to be chlorine. 
which really kind of embodies these trends. As a general rule, we tend to maximize our electron affinity as I go to the right. And then we hit this sweet spot in terms of size somewhere in the third row for being electron for high electron affinities with fluorine and uh, with the first and second row often being comparable depending on which row you're talking about. Fluorine and, fluorine and bromine, pretty close. Selenium, uh, slightly more electro, uh, has a slightly higher electron affinity than oxygen. Arsenic, because it doesn't have to battle that spin pairing quite as badly, much higher than nitrogen. Carbon, a little bit higher than gallium, uh, geranium, germanium, and gallium and boron, pretty much in a dead heat. So, one of, so in general, when you're looking out for periodic trends, watch out for electron affinity as it tends to follow the least clear rules. But in general, try and pay attention to which orbital is being filled. So with the basic ideas of radii, ionization, and affinity, we can actually explain a lot of basic chemical trends. So this is a useful tool to kind of have in your back pocket. However, next time, we're going to slightly uh, change topics as we're going as we're going to focus a little bit more on atomic spectroscopy. Until then, take care.